It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Sarah Drinkwater, who is the director of the Midyar Network, who is going to introduce two fabulous academics who've been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, so take it away, Sarah. Alice, thank you so much. Um, a big and exciting topic today, fairness, discrimination, and how we operationalize the work of ethics and um, doing good within artificial intelligence. I would like to welcome Professor Sandra Wachter. She is Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute, where her research focuses on the ethical implications of AI, big data, and robotics. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, wonderful to be here. Thank you. And also welcoming her, her colleague, Dr. Brent Mittelstad, who also at the Oxford Internet Institute as a senior research fellow and ethicist focused on auditing uh, and the ethical governance of complicated AI systems. Um, so welcome to you both. And before we get stuck into questions and debates, I know that you both have a, a, a slide deck you'd like to walk us through to kind of ground the conversation. So handing over to you both. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for, for having us. And it's nice to be back. I was just here. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll run you through some slides and basically the idea behind one of our most recent works that deals with uh, AI and discrimination and exactly how fair these different bias tests are. And I'll be handing back and forth uh, with Sandra for different parts of the slide deck. But just to, before I get ahead of myself, just to ground things a little bit. So what we're talking about is two things. It's how well does technical work around bias align with the law? And then of course, what does the law look like? We can't talk about the law without talking also about the most recent uh, proposal for an artificial intelligence act from the European Commission. It's notable because it's Europe's first real attempt at a comprehensive framework to regulate AI. We have the GDPR of course, but um, this is the one specifically about AI. And so it's going to be relevant not only to member states of the union, but internationally as well. And of course, it's a draft, so it's not clear exactly how it will pan out or what it will actually require in practice. But at the very least, we can already see that there is a focus on issues of bias. Article 10 here, proposed Article 10, specifically calls for deployers to examine possible biases in their systems. Um, it creates requirements in other parts of the regulation to examine these biases or to test, mitigate, or prevent them. And so the question we really have is, do we have the necessary tools to actually meet that future regula regulatory requirement in practice? Now, Sandra and I, luckily for us, we happened to write a paper before the proposal came out that addressed pretty much exactly that question. We were asking a, a very similar question. Are the bias and fairness tests that we currently have in the technical community legally compatible with the requirements of European law, in particular, non-discrimination law? That seems like the closest thing to look at when we're talking about fairness and bias. And to give you the conclusion of our story, the conclusion of our paper at the start, many of the ways that we currently measure fairness in technical terms are not compatible with the law. And in this slide deck and in this session, we're going to explain why that is the case. So first to start off with a general distinction between types of biases, and this is far from being a clean distinction, it's very much an overlapping distinction. We think that there are two, at least two overlapping types of biases. So we have technical biases and societal biases. The idea behind a technical bias is that these are problems that arise from applying machine learning or AI itself um, that induce some additional biases that are not directly represented in the data you're using, so the training data that you're using with your system. They reflect some sort of failure to predict outcomes with the same accuracy across different groups, different protected groups, and so they lead to skewed, inaccurate, or otherwise unequal outcomes for these different protected groups. Now, not all biases in, in machine learning in AI can be traced back to technical sources or design choices. And so that's where societal bias comes in, which we define as any type of systematic preference to make positive decisions for one group of people relative to another or class of objects relative to another. And so compared to technical biases, social biases are very difficult to fix because they're more a matter of politics, perspectives, shifts and prejudices and preconceptions that will take quite often decades to change. And unequal outcomes, I think it's important to recognize. So unequal outcomes when we're using AI are not necessarily the result of some inaccurate or incomplete data, 
Rather, we can get unequal outcomes that are actually a accurate reflection of the biased world that we live in and the biased world in which AI is learning from and in which it is being used. Yes, so um, to bring this actually down to, to a couple of examples um, from, from the extract to the concrete, here's an example of technical bias. As Brent just said, with technical bias, the problem stems from the technology itself. Uh, many of you will be fully aware that facial recognition software is less accurate uh, on faces of people of color and women. Why? Because predominantly the data um, that is being used to train those face recognition software is based on white male faces. So obviously an algorithm that is learned to see this is the normal face will be more accurate for white male faces than for anybody else. So this is an example of technical bias. The problem stems from the tech itself. Then we have societal bias, um, which shows you that the trouble stems from the human, not just the technology. So for example, if you're having um, somebody that is recruiting and recruiting officer, and this recruiting officer has ableist assumptions, therefore is not giving jobs to people with disability, this decision pattern of that hiring officer will then be used to feed into the algorithm. The algorithm learns that ableist behavior, and then in the future when people apply, people with disability will be rejected from their job opportunity. So this is societal bias. As Brent said, the clean cut is not fully here, but there's an overlap. There's a reason why the data sets trained to face recognition software was predominantly based on white faces to begin with. So the people deciding those design choices reflect the power structures in our society, therefore societal bias. But the distinction is still quite helpful because it shows you um, the aspirations of people in the field of what they want to fix. There's one set of people that wants to fix the technology, another set of people that wants to fix the society. So let's have a look at what the law wants to do. And let's look at uh, fairness and non-discrimination law. Um, and that actually brings me back to a, a very, very personal story when I first got introduced to the idea of what fairness actually means in the law. Uh, I must have been around six or seven years old when we read a very short story in school and the, uh, the, the piece was called The Wise Judge. So The Wise Judge centers around the story um, of two siblings, a brother and a sister, fighting over a piece of cake. And they fight over it and fight over it and they cannot decide how to divide up that piece of cake. So they go to The Wise Judge and ask the judge for advice. And the judge says, well, um, the brother, gets to cut the cake first and the sister gets to choose first. And as I remember that story, um, realizing what an elegant way of making sure that everybody gets an equal piece of cake. Um, if a discipline is able to solve such a complicated problem in such an elegant way, I really wanna be part of this. Um, and to this day, I think it's a great story. And I think most of us will agree that it is a very elegant way to think about that problem. However, what if I told you um, that the sister hasn't eaten in three weeks? Would you still think this is a, a fair way of dividing up the, the cake? And probably many of us would say, well, probably not. And this type of tension, that type of conundrum actually goes back to what the law thinks fairness means and the different types of fairness um, concepts that we have in the law. Roughly, we have two types of um, normative ideas of fairness. We have formal equality and substantive equality. So formal equality means that I'm trying to treat everybody equal. I'm closing my eyes to race, gender, sexual orientation. Everybody gets the same size piece of cake, right? This is the idea of, of formal equality. Substantive equality or de facto equality is different in the sense that it does not want to close the eyes to the differences uh, between certain groups. It wants to take into consideration that some groups are more hungry than others, and therefore we might have to divide up the cake um, differently. So those are the two types of uh, ideas of fairness in the scholarship, in the law. And um, Lyndon B. Johnson has actually summarized it in a wonderful quote, um, perfectly better than anybody uh, I've ever seen, and I think it's very inspiring. Um, and he said in, in his university address that um, you can't just take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate them, bring them up to the line of the race and then just say, you are free to compete with all the others. 
and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. It's not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to go through those gates. And this is the next and the more profound stage of the bitter battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability, not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. And I think that sums it up very, very nicely. And this idea, this philosophical concept of equality and fairness actually found its way into the hard law of non-discrimination law. So roughly the law wants to prevent two types of discrimination. It wants to prevent direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. So direct discrimination means I'm treating somebody less favorably based on a protected attribute that they possess. I'm not giving you the job because of your skin color, your sexual orientation, your political beliefs. This is prohibited in most of those cases because and then it aligns more to formal equality because everybody ought to be treated differently regardless of their um, of the protected attributes. Indirect discrimination works a little bit differently. Indirect discrimination means that if a seemingly neutral provision criterion or practice is applied to everybody equally, and it just so happens that it poses a particular disadvantage on a protected group when compared with others in a similar situation, that this could give rise to um, uh, on the face discrimination, facie discrimination. So roughly what that means is that you are applying something that um, is actually not unfair if you first look at it. So for, for example, if somebody's hiring people that are is deciding I'm only gonna hire people that are taller than two meters, so very tall, you know that height is not a protected attribute such, such as race or sex or gender, whatever it might be. But you will know if I have a height requirement for my job that it will at least indirectly affect women because on average we are shorter. And that is the idea of indirect discrimination, right? You are acknowledging that some groups have it tougher than others. Um, actually the idea of protections against indirect discrimination was created to show where inequalities exist. Because the underlying assumption is that we're all equal, that we're all the same, that we all have the same abilities. So if the outcome isn't equal across groups, then there must be something wrong with your system, not the people. And therefore, um, this idea was created to really bring about substantive equality. It's there's a diagnostical tool that shows you where social engineering has to happen, that shows you where social struggles are still going on, and that shows you how to dismantle actively inequality in our society. So this is the idea of, of substantive equality. And in fact, um, this idea of taking an active part in society, but both the private and the public sector is something that the law dictates. The law wants you to be an active player, not just a passive bystander in actively bringing about social change, leveling the playing field. Substantive equality really means dismantling inequality, redistributing resources, thinking about that everybody gets the same access to social goods. It's not just about economic disadvantage, it's also about cultural and social rights. It's about social inclusion, solidarity and participation in our society. So you can see that the law really wants to fix society. But the next question is, how does tech see fairness? Yeah, and that's, that is a very distinct question. And it speaks to almost a different set of communities that are working, you know, maybe with some, uh, some understanding of what the law requires, but potentially in different countries under different legal frameworks um, that can lead to very different requirements in practice if they're being att paid attention to uh, at all. But to try to make things simpler, to try to find some sort of coherence between non-discrimination law and the technical work around fairness and bias in AI, um, we proposed a new classification scheme for fairness metrics in machine learning and AI. And again, by fairness metrics, all I mean is a statistical way of measuring fairness in practice. 
Now, our proposal in this classification system is for the distinction between bias preserving and bias transforming metrics. And if you're interested in the, the definition in more detail, we go into it in great detail in the paper. I'm very much just giving you sort of the, the headline uh, view here. So we reviewed popular ways of measuring fairness, popular uh, fairness metrics based on the state of the art. And we created this classification system that basically reflects how different metrics deal with societal bias and thus how they align with the aims of non-discrimination law. And the whole system is based around the notion of conditional independence, which again, I won't go into in detail here, but it's in the paper. The idea with bias preserving metrics is what you're doing is to you're, a metric will seek to replicate error rates that are found in the training data or found in the status quo in the outputs of the model uh, that is being trained. And so we can say a metric is bias preserving if it's always satisfied by a perfect classifier that exactly predicts its target labels with zero error, replicating bias present in the data. Basic idea here is you have a set of biases within the data, you view the status quo as neutral, and if you are creating a classifier that then perfectly reflects those, those biases within your training data, um, you have created a, a, a fair classifier. Um, any metrics that, that do that, that treat that's the status quo in that neutral way would be considered bias preserving. In contrast, uh, metrics that don't take the status quo for granted, that don't treat the status quo as a neutral starting point for measuring fairness would be considered bias transforming. So those are metrics where they're not concerned with replicating error rates. They have different aims, but typically they're looking to match decision rates uh, between groups. But again, basic idea here is bias transforming metrics do not take the status quo as a neutral starting point. And not doing that, at least in the eyes of the law, is very important because we know the status quo is not neutral. But I'll hand back to Sandra here to talk about that. Yes. yes. So, so in the paper, we give um, a bunch of examples that show how the status quo is not neutral. Since we are limited to time here, I'm only going to talk about one example. As I said, we do more in the paper um, to, to talk about this. Um, I want to use the example of grades. Um, and grading in general. And I think most of us will agree that whenever you're being asked to show your grades, we can all agree that there's a subjective element to grading in general. You can think about many, many ways of bias creeping in. But what about math grades? You could make the argument there's ground truth when it comes to math. Two and two is four. There is not much room for interpretation. So if we were to give out, let's say, fellowships, um, or university admission places based on math grades, that is a fair criterion to assess merit. What you might not know is that there is interesting research from 2015 that shows that um, middle and high school teachers assess the mathematical skills of boys more favorably than girls, even though they have the same, if not higher abilities than the boys in their class. So they actually get worse grades than boys, even though they're just, if not smarter than the boys there. They get less mentorship, which also leads to the fact that their grades are not as good as the boys, and they're less encouraged to take up STEM um, subjects later on in, in their career paths. That gender bias travels with women um, to the job market. Interesting research shows that if you send out two batches of identical resumes to open job advertisements, and one batch of CVs has female sounding names in it, and the other has male sounding names in it, and the rest is completely identical, both female and male assessors of those job advertisement jobs posting um, mark women as less qualified than men, even though they're completely identical. They are less likely to be invited to a job interview. If they are actually um, proposed that job, if they're offered that job, their salary is much lower um, than their one of their male counterparts. And they're very often overseen for uh, promotions. The same gender bias is reflected in reference letters where women are being described as hardworking and team players. Male, male colleagues are being described as geniuses and, and trailblazers. And you could say, well, this is just a matter of education, gender bias. We just need to re-educate um, people making important decisions. 
But the problem is that the idea of gender roles is actually created very early on in our lives. So for example, there's research that shows that, um, that if you show children by the age of six pictures of boys doing cooking and sewing, they will misremember seeing a girl. So at the age of six, our children already have a pretty clear idea of what gender roles are supposed to look like in our society. But the problem is AI does not know about that. AI doesn't know about the social story between the data points. And I'm pretty sure most of us don't know about the social story behind the data points. And now think about how often grades and reference letters and salaries are being used as objective criteria to make decisions. Think about how often your grades open up doors to universities, to jobs, to fellowships, how often reference letters were used to give out housing or jobs or loans. Think about how often we use the fact how often somebody has been promoted or salary and equated with a measure of merit and success. Think about how often salary is being used to decide if somebody should get insurance or housing, what type of advertisement they see. At first glance, we think that we're dealing with fair data. We think that we have some information about um, equal ground truth, but the problem is the status quo is all but neutral. So that, that brings us back to our, our question that we're going to conclude with here, which is how exactly can we reconcile fair work, technical work on fairness in AI with the law? Can this technical work actually support the substantive aims of the law, which is to address existing inequalities in society? And so generally we can see how the two different types of metrics will align with the aims of the law. So. Let's go back to the underlying assumptions of fairness metrics. Bias preserving metrics are more akin to formal equality or the idea of not changing things or correcting for existing inequalities. Whereas bias transforming metrics are more akin to substantive equality. Again, the idea of changing things or actually trying to address existing inequalities. So if the idea of substantive equality is that we should be eroding inequality, dismantling disparity, and we're doing that in order to achieve parity and inclusion between groups, keeping things as they are, treating the status quo as neutral, and not just simply seeking to not make things worse with AI is not good enough, again, in the eyes of the law. By design, bias-preserving metrics run the risk of freezing or locking in existing social injustices, discriminatory effects, which does not align with the core aim of EU non-discrimination law, which is to change society for the better and achieve substantive equality in practice. If we ignore the reasons behind existing inequalities, you run into a problem. You need to understand why decisions were made in a biased way historically in order to correct for the inequalities they created going forward. And so we're trying to call attention to this very, very important decision that is being made routinely by developers and deployers of AI when they're working on fairness, which is in choosing how to measure fairness, you are essentially saying we are going to do something about the status quo, try to improve things, or we're going to take the status quo for granted as a neutral starting point and just try not to make things any worse. So how exactly how widespread is this potential problem. We're saying bias preserving metrics do not align well with EU non-discrimination law, but how common are they actually in practice? Well, again, we did a review of popular uh, fairness metrics in AI in the technical literature. I'm not going to go through these metrics or formula. This is taken from the paper, but our headline finding is that of 20 of the most popular technical fairness metrics in AI, 13 out of the 20 or two thirds of them are bias preserving. And that's very significant because using bias preserving metrics to make decisions that are driven by AI will create a legal problem for deployers of AI. It's also somewhat of an unsurprising finding given that so much of the technical work on fairness in AI comes from North America, where you have very different anti-discrimination legal frameworks, which vary in terms of their aims across formal and substantive equality. Now, just to help help out regulators, policymakers, and deployers of systems, um, we also thought about, you know, how can we help make the right choice around the metric that you're going to use to measure fairness? Let's say you want to do the right thing. Which metric should you actually choose? Well, we tried to boil down our message to as simple a, a format as possible by literally just giving a, a checklist 
for bias preservation, where you can answer these questions and it will direct you to using uh, preserving or transforming metrics based on essentially the, the, the existence of historical social inequality in a given decision-making context or in a given use case. Again, this is in the paper um, and it, it will run you through the core of the idea very simply um, in a way that will lead you to one or the other. And again, this is for using AI to make decisions. If we're talking about testing for bias, that's a different conversation where both, of met both types of metrics uh, have a role to play. And then the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that in terms of which metric to choose, before we ever wrote this paper on bias preservation, we did some work on the automation of fairness and again, non-discrimination law and essentially why under EU non-discrimination law, you can't automate fairness in the way that might be imagined with a lot of the, the technical work on fairness in AI. And we proposed our own fairness metric called conditional demographic disparity that aligns with the aims of EU non-discrimination law. And in our language here is a bias uh, transforming metric. And so essentially what we proposed in that paper is that deployers should be publishing summary statistics that will provide a baseline of evidence for all the people involved with using and affected by AI in a given context. We, we propose that because in practice, when non-discrimination cases go to trial, quite often there's a huge gap in access to statistical evidence of inequality and also the expertise to produce that evidence and to interpret that evidence. And so the idea here is with these summary statistics, you're providing a neutral starting point for everyone involved. And you're helping the judiciary, companies and others that are trying to make AI fair in practice to show easily that they align with the core aims of the law. Essentially, what, what the metric is doing, conditional demographic disparity is doing, is ensuring that cases of automated discrimination are assessed consistently without saying what is normatively fair in any given case. That's always a decision that should be left to human judgment on a case-by-case -case basis, which is essentially how non-discrimination law is currently practiced. And it, it just reminds me to say that even though we're talking about EU non-discrimination law, the non-discrimination frameworks in the UK, even post-Brexit, are still very much formed from and based on the EU framework. So this is just as relevant for practice in the EU, uh, UK as it is in the EU at this point. This is the math of conditional demographic disparity. I'm not going to explain it. It's just to say that it's there in the paper for anybody that wants to use this in practice. And the metric and our recommendations around it have been picked up in a number of different policy reports by uh, bodies like the European Commission, World Economic Forum, the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. And we've also seen it implemented in practice completely independently of us um, by Amazon in their SageMaker Clarify tool that they just implemented uh, for, for Amazon Web Services, which is fantastic because it means that our metric alongside a number of other uh, metrics are available for customers of, of Amazon Web Services, um, but of course can also be picked up and used by anybody if they want to actually do bias testing according to European existing European legal stand, standards which again will be very important for actually putting the Artificial Intelligence Act into practice. And also to say all these papers are freely and publicly available. And we're hoping that you know, there will be further implementation of it uh, in the same vein. And so we'll, we'll finish there. I hope that sets a good baseline for the discussion and yeah, really look forward to the discussion and your questions. And thank you so much for, for entertaining us and for, for listening to uh, this, this extended talk. Thank you Thank so you. much. That was an incredibly, an incredibly rich and thorough presentation. I, I learned an awful lot. I guess um, I'm curious, you know, to your point around, we don't know yet what this act will look like in practice. There's a consultative period ahead. Um, but at the same time, you have to assume, given that this is the first kind of proposed global framework for AI, that it will have a knock-on effect sort of in other locations around the world. What do you see as the kind of the opportunities and the limitations? I know you've, you've spoken particularly in this talk around the limitations of all the limitations and challenges of this, this piece around bias. But more broadly, what do you see if you're looking at the proposed Artificial Intelligence Act overall? What do you see as the kind of pros and cons? Yeah, maybe I can start with that. Yes. Okay, great. So again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the fact that we are going that direction and that regulators in, in Europe really see the need to do something and there's still time to to adjust. So um, whatever I'm going to say is obviously just based on, on, on the current state of affairs um, because overall I think it's a, a fantastic, fantastic idea. 
I think one thing um, that I would like to, you know, uh, if there was one thing that I would that is like to learn from the work that, that that we have been doing is to understand that how diverse bias and unfairness actually is um and so the the idea of having a one fits all solution is something that is not possible nor aspirational so the idea that you can just talk about one type of fairness or one type of injustice is just something that doesn't really exist you know the, the way how discrimination operates um the symptoms of, of of discrimination are very different in germany in italy in the uk to india the global south in general the us right so the idea that you're gonna have one particular test that does all the work for you is something that is absolutely not not possible so um in the in the same way that you are you know it's, it's, people live between the ones and zeros and there's a lot of gray area that we have to embrace and the law actually likes gray areas the the, the law wants to be flexible and that's not necessarily something that computer scientists embrace so um, i've been working with computer scientists for a very long time and i would like us to to learn from each other that the idea is not to find a super bowl that does everything but actually that we learn to embrace um diversity in, in in that sense and also acknowledge that the struggles and the hurdles and disadvantages of people are very diverse depending on the context mm -hmm. so we probably have to have very different systems depending on where we deploy our work again why one of the reasons why we named the paper why fairness cannot be automated um it should also say and that's a good thing um so uh, trying to keep the human um in that context alive i think is the most important thing for me but yeah i'm talking too much over to, to brett I'm not, I don't think I have anything else to add. I think you, you perfectly captured what I was going to say as well. But I think that's I think that's so fascinating, like the tension between the multiplicity of human experience and the multiplicity of discrimination that exists in society and the challenge of of regulating, you know, even looking at the EU, like you know, Brent, you mentioned the how different discrimination is in North America versus Europe, for example. But even within Europe, there are incredibly different um sets of challenges, norms, behaviors across the various countries. And I think there's something really interesting for me in how we how we at once have these aspirational uh, pieces of regulation that kind of set the pace and set the tone while also thinking about how we operationalize this. You know, particularly for me coming from the startup scene, um, I'm quite interested in the, uh, I'd love to hear you talk a bit more about the the tool you, um, you know, you spoke about this briefly at the end of that presentation, um, name checking Amazon's use. But for the entrepreneurs who are tuning in, um, or the practitioners, I should say, what do you think of as, as useful tools they can be looking at now as ways of detecting bias in their systems? You know, particularly, you know, because so much of the kind of responsible AI community has been dominated by the largest companies in the world. And I think there's incredible interest from startups and business companies now that may not have the same resources or the benefit of having academics in their teams. Um, Sandra, do you want me to start with this one, or do you want to? Um, I definitely want to say something to it, but I, I let I let you go first because I won't stop if I want. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What I what I would say is that one of the nice things about the work in this area is that there's quite a bit of it has already been implemented into open source toolkits. Um, the idea there being that you're essentially running the checks yourself, and it it depends on the model that you're working with, and you know the the type of AI you're working with, but um, yeah, it's there for self-testing and self-assessment. And to be fair, I think that's a lot of what the, the new regulation is calling for is essentially, I hesitate to use the word self-regulation, but at the very least, a lot of internal testing around things like bias, um, rather than it being a third party, say a third party auditor or regulator um, doing it for you. <clears throat> so we mentioned the Amazon uh, toolkit, which, you know, there are lots of customers of, of Amazon Web Services, so that will be... Um, um, a big one. Um, but you have things like uh, Fairness 360 Toolkit. I want to say it's IBM's toolkit that I believe is open source as well. Um, the Alan Turing Institute, I know, uh, put out a, a toolkit uh, with Accenture, I want to say, although I'm not sure if that one is open source. I don't think it is. Um, yeah, essentially, there's, there's lots of these toolkits where it's supposed to be taken up by a development team in the organization um, to, to do testing. But then, you know, you have things that are less technical, like uh, algorithmic impact assessments, documentation mm -hmm. standards, like data sheets for data sets. 
um, these sorts of things where they're more resembling, I'd say, a data protection impact assessment or a privacy impact yeah. assessment, completely different set of people potentially uh, doing that. But yeah, I'd, I'd hand over to Sandra too. Yes, I think for, for me, that's the most important thing, especially um, I think with, especially with the bias test that we have come up with, this is not about affirmative action. This is not about, you know, um, giving a leg up to, to somebody um, because of their skin color or their gender or sexual orientation. This is about acknowledging that we have very bad tools of measuring merit. Mm. So this is about trying to uncover hidden talent that is currently not walking through the doors because we're using um, very bad proxies for merit. So for example, the the, the, the the example that I gave with the grades, right? Girls being just as talented as the boys, but they get worse grades, right? So how can you use this information to create an algorithm that accounts for that, right? You could say, well, a, ba a B for an A is as much as an A for a boy, for example. Or, we could, or you could say, well, let's not use grades to begin with. That's a very bad measure for, for, for competence and mathematical skills to begin with, right? So this is not about opening the doors and pushing somebody through who doesn't understand it. It's acknowledging that we're pushing people through the door at the moment who don't deserve it. So if you take fairness seriously, it is a win-win-win situation. You would actually get better people that are more competent than the ones that you currently have and therefore make it uh, a fair and equal play, playing field. And I think that's really important. This is not about charity. It's not about affirmative yes. action. It's about uncovering hidden talent. Yes. And I think for any business that has to be incredibly compelling, right? Like like I heard I hear that math story and it just breaks my heart because as a as a good math student who didn't get the best grades, I now look back and think my god, was I terrible? Was I, you know, um it's and when you think about what I love about that framing Sandra is I think sometimes there is such a narrative around machine learning companies that you know, the point that you both made in the presentation that the status quo is not neutral, that we're not starting from some mythical um, uh, neutral starting point and then introducing bias, we're basically replicating society and all of its challenges and, and failures. Um, when you think about AI and machine learning more broadly, outside of this piece around bias, there is this incredible need to build trust. I think there's been such a dystopian narrative around the field for rightly, for, you know, for many of the right reasons. Um, for companies kind of working in this space, what what do you think is essential to kind of build to sort of use this kind of technology wisely? When we, I mean, obviously, we're leaving aside bias tests because that's been the core focus of this conversation. I don't know. Do you want to, or should I do this one? Um, I would just briefly say I, I talked about. So I, I was I was on the ten o'clock session as well, and we were talking about um, trustworthiness and, and going over a lot of the things that could be done there. Um, I think one of the key things for me, at least, though, is that, and I think this applies both to the company developer deployer side and, let's say, the end user, customer, patient side of things, mm -hmm. is that you have, you know, even for companies that have a real desire to, say, make their AI more fair or to be transparent or to be accountable, they're crying out for somebody to tell them what those things actually mean in practice and how they can do it in a way that will actually you know, make people trust them or, or make their systems more trustworthy. And this is why the approach that we're taking is, is let, I mean, the approach we take across our work is not so much about answering what is right or fair in general, because that's that's impossible. And this this follows the method of, of ethics in general, where we're not, you know, as an ethicist, we're not there to give you the right answer. We're there to help you uh, have a conversation to get to the right answer for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think the tools that we, we are using need to be designed and used in the same way. They need to mm -hmm. be seen as a decision support system. Yeah. They're there to facilitate a conversation, to give everybody access to the same test, the same evidence, so you can be having a conversation on, on an equal playing field, rather than, you know, having this massive information asymmetry um, in terms of, say, statistical evidence, for example, um, which actually marks a lot of those conversations that we have currently. So I at least see it as, in terms of trustworthiness, it's an opportunity to make existing decision-making uh, procedures more trustworthy by mm -hmm. leveling the playing field in terms of the evidence that we're talking about. And what I'm hearing from you kind of brings me back to what Sandra was saying about the sometimes there is this desire 
from certain constituents for a silver bullet, for there to be one very clear answer when it's far more about the process, it's far more about having transparency around how decisions are taken, which hopefully should help to build trustworthiness over time. So we, we have a question in the chat from Philip Jackson. Um, fascinating talk, thank you. Please, can you clarify the distinction between error rates and decision rates? If you're measuring, measuring errors in decisions, then they appear to be the same. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to or should I do this? Uh, let, me, let me take a quick stab at it and then and then you can talk about the counterfactual universe stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, so just the, the very the very sort of headline answer to that is when we're thinking about decision rates, that is the proportion of people from different groups that receive certain decisions. So let's just say a positive decision and a negative decision. Whereas when when we're talking about error rates, we're consider uh, we're interested in the proportion of people in those groups that got the right decision versus the wrong decision, so the decision that they actually deserved. And the problem that you run into with a lot of fairness metrics is quite often they're premised on the idea that you're going to collect data about counterfactual worlds that don't exist in order to know what the right decision was. But yeah, I'll hand over to Sandra at this point. Yeah, I think that was perfectly sum up like one is really concerned with the outcomes how many people did actually get the loans and what's proportion between certain groups that's um that's uh, decision rates error rates is really about false positive false negatives so you're learning something you're looking at past data and you're looking at oh somebody um that i admitted to university and actually did well uh didn't actually do well in in in, in at school is a, is, a, is a false positive and the, the same country the other way. And you're trying to make sure that you're not making more mistakes than you used to do, right? But this assumes that you have ground truth, that you know that the decisions that you made in the past were correct, um, which you don't have for two reasons, because you don't really know why the people didn't get into um, university, there could be various reasons. There could be reasons as in they didn't have the grades. And we just talked about what, what grades mean in this society, right? Um, so you don't actually know if you made the right decision. And you don't know how well the people would have done that you did not admit to university in the first place, right? So you're pretending to know something about ground truth when you actually have to be very, very fair and open and honest about the limitations of what we do actually know. So a much more reliable measure is to look at the outcomes, right? How many people did actually get in university? And if it's not equal across groups, then there might be something wrong with the system. If you don't have any black people in a certain course at university, then there might be something wrong with how selections are being made. And therefore you need to go back to the drawing board and yeah. think about how you selection candidates. And again, thinking about very good proxies for merit that can good in a way well well predict how well a student will be doing in the future and that is exactly what we're trying to do come up with good criteria that actually measure merit brilliant thank you so much i'm so sorry we're totally out of time i want to thank sandra and brent for joining us today um and we're going to be handing back over to alice <laughs>